Chapters 3 and 4 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Use of Reason attempts to show that in the field to which reason applies we are compelled to use it and are justified in trusting it the great majority of people are brought up to believe that some particular set of dogmas are objects of faith and that there are penalties more or less severe for the application of reason to these dogmas what particular set it happens to be is a matter of geography in a crowded modern city like new york it is a matter of the particular block on which the child is born a child born on hester street will be taught that his welfare depends upon his never eating meat and butter from the same dish a child born on tenth avenue will be taught that it is a matter of his not eating meat on fridays a child born on madison avenue will be taught that it is a question of the precise metaphysical process by which bread is changed into human body and wine into human blood each of these children will be assured that his human reason is fallible that it is extremely dangerous to apply it to this sacred subject and that the proper thing to do is to accept the authority of some ancient tradition or some institution or some official or some book for which a special sanction is claimed has there ever been in the world any revelation outside or above human reason could there ever be such a thing in order to test this possibility select for yourself the most convincing way by which a special revelation could be handed down to mankind Take any of the ancient orthodox ways, the finding of graven tablets on a mountain top, or a voice speaking from a burning bush, or an angel appearing before a great concourse of people and handing out a written scroll. Suppose that were to happen, let us say, at the next Yale Harvard football game. Suppose the news were to be flashed to the ends of the earth that God had thus presented to mankind an entirely new religion. What would be the process by which the people of London or Calcutta would decide upon that revelation? First, they would have to consider the question whether it was an American newspaper fake. By no means an easy question. Second, they would have to consider the chances of its being an optical delusion. Then, assuming they accepted the sworn testimony of ten thousand mature and competent witnesses, they would have to consider the possibility of someone having invented a new kind of invisible aeroplane. Assuming they were convinced that it was really a supernatural being, they would next have to decide the chance of its being a visitor from Mars, or from the fourth dimension of space, or from the devil. In considering all this, they would necessarily have to examine the alleged revelation. What was the literary quality of it? What was the moral quality of it? What would be the effect upon mankind if the alleged revelation were to be universally adopted and applied? Manifestly, all these are questions for the human reason, the human judgment. There is no other method of determining them there would be nothing for any individual person or for men as a whole to do except to apply their best powers and as the phrase is make up their minds about the matter reason would be the judge and the new revelation would be the prisoner at the bar humanity might say this is a real inspiration we will submit ourselves to it and follow it and allow no one from now on to question it but inevitably there would be some who would say tommy rot there would be others who would say this new revelation isn't working it is repressing progress it is stifling the mind these people would stand up for their conviction they would become martyrs and all the world would have to discuss them and who would decide between them and the great mass of men 
reason, the judge, would decide. It is perfectly true that human reason is fallible. Infallibility is an absolute, a concept of the mind, and not a reality. Life has not given us infallibility, any more than it has given us omniscience, or omnipotence, or any of the other attributes which we call divine. Life has given us powers, more or less weak, more or less strong, but all capable of improvement and development. Reason is the tool whereby mankind has won supremacy over the rest of the animal kingdom, and is gradually taking control of the forces of nature. It is the best tool we have, and because it is the best, we are driven irresistibly to use it. And how strange that some of us can find no better use for it than to destroy its own self. Visit one of the Jesuit fathers and hear him seek to persuade you that reason is powerless against faith and must abdicate to faith. You answer, yes, father, you have persuaded me. I admit the fallibility of my mortal powers, and I begin by applying my doubts of them to the arguments by which you have just convinced me. I was convinced, but of course I cannot be sure of a conviction attained by fallible reason. Therefore, I am just where I was before, except that I am no longer in position to be certain of anything. You answer in good faith, and take up your hat and depart, closing the door of the good father's study behind you. But stop a moment. Why do you close the door? You close the door because your reason tells you that otherwise the cold air outside will blow in and make the good father uncomfortable. You put your hat on because your reason has not yet been applied to the problem of the cause of baldness. You step out onto the street, and when you hear a sudden noise, you step back onto the curbstone because your reason tells you that an automobile is coming and that on the sidewalk you are safe from it. So you go on, using your reason in a million acts of your life whereby your life is preserved and developed. And if anybody suggested that the fallibility of your reason should cause you to delay in front of an automobile, you would apply your reason to the problem of that person and decide that he was insane. And I say that just as there is insanity in everyday judgments and relationships, so there is insanity in philosophy, metaphysics, and religion. The seed and source of all this kind of insanity being the notion that it is the duty of anybody to believe anything which cannot completely justify itself as reasonable. Nowadays, as ideas are spreading, the champions of dogma are hard put to it, and you will find their minds a muddle of two points of view. The Jewish rabbi will strive desperately to think of some hygienic objection to the presence of meat and butter on the same plate. The Catholic priest will tell you that fish is a very wholesome article of food, and that anyhow we all eat too much. The Methodist and the Baptist and the Presbyterian will tell you that if men did not rest one day in seven, their health would break down. Thus they justify faith by reason, and reconcile the conflict between science and theology. Accepting this method, I experiment and learn that it improves my digestion and adds to my working power if I play tennis on Sunday. I follow this indisputably rational form of conduct and find myself in conflict with the faith of the ancient state of Delaware, which obliges me to serve a term in its state's prison for having innocently and unwittingly desecrated its day of holiness. If you read Professor Burry's little book, A History of Freedom of Thought, you will discover that there has been a long conflict over the right of men to use their minds. And the victory is not yet. The term free thinker, which ought to be the highest badge a man could wear, 
is still almost everywhere throughout America a term of vague terror. In the state of California today, there is a Criminal Syndicalism Act, which provides a maximum of 14 years in jail for any person who shall write or publish or speak any words expressive of the idea that the United States government should be overthrown in the same way that it was established, that is, by force. Only a few months ago the writer of this book was on the witness stand for two days and had the painful, almost incredible experience of being battered and knocked about by an inquisitive district attorney who cross-examined him as to every detail of his beliefs and read garbled extracts from his published writings in the effort to make it appear that he held some belief which might possibly prejudice the jury against him. The defendant in this case, a returned soldier who had spent three years as a volunteer in the trenches, and had been twice wounded and once gassed, was accused not merely of approving the Soviet form of government, but also of having printed uncomplimentary references to priests and religious institutions. Nowadays, it is the property class which has taken possession of the powers of government, and which presumes to censor the thinking of mankind in its own interest. But whether it be priestcraft, or whether it be capitalism, which seeks to bind the human mind, it comes to the same thing, and the effort must be met by the assertion that, in spite of errors and blunders, and the serious harm these may do, there is no way for men to advance save by using the best powers of thinking they possess and proclaiming their conclusions to others. Speaking theologically for the moment, God has given us our reasoning powers and also the impulse to use them, and it is inconceivable that he should seek to restrict their use or should give to anyone the power to forbid their use. It is his truth which we seek, and his which we proclaim. In so doing, we perform our highest act of faith, and we refuse to be troubled by the idea that for this service he will reward us by an eternity of sulfur and brimstone. Throughout the remainder of this book, it will be assumed that the reader accepts this point of view, or, at any rate, that he is willing, for the purposes of experiment, to give it a trial, and see where it leads him. We shall proceed to consider the problems of human life in the light of reason, to determine how they come to be, and how they can be solved. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4. The Origin of Morality Compares the ways of nature with human morality and tries to show how the latter came to be. Seventy years ago, Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of the Species, in which he defied the theological dogma of his time by the shocking idea that life had evolved by many stages of progress from the diatom to man. This, of course, did not conform to the story of the Garden of Eden, and so Darwinism was fought as an invention of the devil, and in the interior of America there are numerous sectarian colleges where the dread term evolution is spoken in awed whispers. Only the other day I read in my newspaper the triumphant proclamation of some clergyman that Darwinism had been overthrown. This reverend gentleman had got mixed up because some biologists were disputing some detail of the method by which the evolution of species had been brought about. Do species change by the gradual elimination of the unfit, or do they change by sudden leaps? the mutation theory of de Vries. Are acquired powers transmitted to posterity, or is the germ plasm unaffected by its environment? Concerning such questions, the scientists debate. But the fact that life has evolved in an ordered series from the lower, 
forms to the higher, and that each individual reproduces in embryo and in infancy the history of this long process, these facts are now the basis of all modern thinking, and as generally accepted as the rotation of the earth. You may study this process of evolution from the outside, in the multitude of forms which it has assumed, and in their reactions one to another. Or you may study it from the inside in your own soul, the emotions which accompany it, the impulse or craving which impels it, the élan vital, as it is called by the French philosopher Bergson. The Christians call it love, and Nietzsche, who hated Christianity, called it the will to power, and persuaded himself that it was the opposite of love. You will find in the essays of Professor Huxley one entitled Evolution and Ethics, in which he sets forth the complete unmorality of nature, and declares that there is no way by which what mankind knows as morality can have originated in the process of nature, or can be reconciled to natural law. This statement, coming from a leading agnostic, was welcome to the theologians. But when I first read the essay, as a student of sixteen, it seemed to me narrow. I thought I saw a standpoint from which the contradiction disappeared. The difference between the morality of Christ and the morality of nature is merely the difference between a lower and a higher stage of mental development. The animal loves and seeks by instinct to preserve the life which it knows, that is to say, its own life and the life of its young. The wolf knows nothing about the feelings of a deer. But man, in his savage state, develops reasoning powers enough to realize that there are others like himself, the members of his own tribe, and he makes for himself taboos which forbid him to kill and eat the members of that tribe. At the present time, humanity has developed its reason and imaginative sympathy to include in the tribe one or two hundred million people, while to those outside the tribe it still preserves the attitude of the wolf. How came it that a mind so acute as Huxley's went so far astray on the question of the evolution of morality? The answer is that this was the factory age in England, and the great scientist, a rebel in theological matters, was in economics a child of his time. We find him using the formulas of bourgeois biology to ridicule Henry George and his plea for the freeing of the land. Competition is the life of trade, ran the 19th century slogan, and competition was the god of the 19th century biology. Tennyson summed it up in a phrase, Nature red in tooth and claw, with raven. And this was found convenient by Manchester manufacturers, who wished to shut little children up for fourteen hours a day in cotton mills, and to harness women to drag cars in the coal mines, and to be told by the learned men of their colleges and the holy men of their churches that this was the survival of the fittest. It was nature's way of securing the advancement of the race. But now we are preparing for an era of cooperation, and it occurs to our men of science to go back to nature and find out what really are her ways. If you will read Kropotkin's Mutual Aid as a Factor in Evolution, you will find a complete refutation of the old bourgeois biology, and a view of nature which reveals in it the germs of human morality. Kropotkin points out that everywhere throughout nature it is the social and not the solitary animals which are most numerous and most successful. There are many millions of ants and bees for every hawk or eagle, and certainly in the state of nature there were thousands of deers for every lion or tiger that preyed upon them. And all these social creatures have their ways of being, 
which it requires no stress of the imagination to compare with the tribal customs and the moral codes of mankind. The different animals prey upon one another, but they do not prey upon their own species, except in a very few rare cases. The only beast that makes a regular practice of exploiting his own kind is man. By hundreds of interesting illustrations, Kropotkin shows that mutual aid and mutual self-protection are the means whereby the higher forms of being have been evolved. Insects and birds and fish, nearly all the herbivorous mammals, and even a great many of the carnivores, help one another and protect one another. The chattering monkeys in the treetops drove out the saber-toothed tiger from the grove, because there were so many of them, and when they saw him they all set up a shriek and clamor which deafened and confused him. And when by and by these monkeys developed an opposed thumb, and broke off a branch of a tree for a club, and fastened a sharp stone on the end of it for an axe, and fell upon the saber-toothed tiger and exterminated him, they did it because they had learned solidarity, even as the workers of the world are today learning solidarity in the face of the beast of capitalism. Man has survived by the cunning of his brain, we are told, and that is true. But first among the products of that cunning brain has been the knowledge that by himself he is the most helpless and pitiful of creatures while standing together and forming societies and developing moralities he is the master of the world he has not yet learned that lesson entirely he has learned it only for his own nation therefore he takes the highest skill of his hand and the subtlest wit of his brain and uses them to manufacture poison gases. At the present hour he is painfully realizing that his poison formulas all become known to the tribes whom he calls his enemies, and so it is his own destruction that he is engaged in contriving. In other words, man has come to a time when his mechanical skill, his mastery over the forces of nature, has developed more rapidly than his moral sense and his imaginative sympathy. His ability to destroy life has become dangerously greater than his desire to preserve it. So he confronts the fair face of nature as an insane creature, wrecking not merely everything that he himself has built up, but everything that nature has built in the ages before him. He is striving now with infinite agony to make this fact real to himself and to mend his evil ways and the first step in that process is to root out from his mind the devil's doctrine which in his blindness and greed he has himself implanted that there is any way for him to find real happiness or to make any worthwhile progress on this earth by the method of inflicting misery and torment upon his fellow men. End of chapter 4